Oh, that's caught you out, hasn't it? One one minute to one, and I'm on 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 live already. Hello, everyone. It's Chris Green, the History Chap, and welcome to another uh, ramble through British history on Fridays. Uh, it's sort of becoming a bit of a regular thing, and of course, it's Good Friday, which is really nice as well. A bit of a relax. I don't know if people are on public holidays or indeed have just taken a day off today, or whether this is business as usual for you. Don't know, but um, lovely to see you. And already I can see lots of people coming in and it's a, it's, um, well, I'll say hello to a lot of you in a moment, but let's just uh, maybe, maybe take it a little bit tighter than I have in the last few weeks. So this week, we're going to be looking at what happened in British history this week, back in the past. And well, we've had, oh, golly, this week was, uh, it's a mad one, actually. Uh, we, Queen Elizabeth I died in 1603, succeeded by James VI of Scotland, uh, James I of England. Uh, we had The Great Escape. Yeah, the film, um, Steve McQueen, obviously trying to get to freedom on his motorbike. That didn't happen in the uh, in the real Great Escape. But the event itself did happen, uh, and I've made a video about that as well in the past. So uh, that happened this week. Uh, we've got uh, the first rugby international ever played, Scotland versus England. Actually, this week is a bit of a Scottish week. I've already talked about Elizabeth I dying and, and James VI of Scotland becoming King of England. Uh, we have the first uh, international rugby match on the 27th of March, 1871. Um, what else have we got? We have um, uh, the Battle of the Seven. Yeah, I bet you've never. Now you're probably all thinking, "Oh, here we go. It's Chris in Worcester." Um, you know, he was talking about the River Seven. They're bound to be in battle down here somewhere. No, this is the Battle of the Seven in uh, North America. It was actually uh, a lot of people call it the last battle of the English Civil War fought in the English colonies in North America. So that's a an interesting one. I might do a might do a story about that one in the future because that's that's just one of those little bits of history not many people in America probably know, and even fewer people in England or Britain know as well. So um, what else do we have this week? Oh, Hector Macdonald died in 1903. Uh, many of you will know Sir, uh, General Sir Hector Macdonald, uh, man who rose Crofter's son, rose through the Victorian Army from from the ranks to become a general. A uh, great story, sad ending as well. Committed suicide in Paris in 1903 with allegations of homosexuality against him at the time. Um, what else we got? 26th of March, 1917, the Battle of Gaza. Yeah, can you believe? Uh, things have never really changed in 100 years, have they, in Gaza? But the Battle of Gaza at the time, uh, Gaza and Palestine were uh, ruled by the Ottoman Turks, who were on the side of the Germans in the First World War. And uh, this was the British, or British and Australian, some, some New Zealanders there as well, I think, but uh, trying to push up from Egypt into Palestine. Uh, as it was at the time. So, um, and the Battle of Gaza took place 1917. So the, you know, the Turks, the Turks kept fighting quite tenaciously for a long time in the war. There was, a, there was an eventual collapse at the end. But um, yeah, so, so there you go. 28th of March, 1879, Battle of Hobani in Zululand. I did a video about that last week, actually. So we'll talk about that in a little while. But, um, and also on the 28th of March, 1942, the San Nazaire raid in Second World War. A commander raid uh, out uh, at San Jose uh, at the um, at the the U boat pens there, which um, yeah, quite a few of you have said, Chris, will you do a, a video about that? So I will put it on my list. Okay, uh, what else have we got to this week? Oh, this is a week where we had the, the bloodiest battle in England, Battle of Toton, up in Yorkshire during the Wars of the Roses. We've also had the uh, Battle of Kambula, which is the follow up to Klobani in Zulu War, um, where sort of uh, the Zulus won at Klobani, the British won at uh, Kab Kambula quite decisively. Might talk about that if we've got time in a while. And uh, 29th of March, 1912, uh, Scott, Robert uh, Scott, Robert Falcon Scott, Captain Scott, Scott of the Antarctic, uh, died in the Antarctic. Uh, it was his last one. It was his last entry into his diary. So it's assumed that he died that night uh, in the tent, along with the rest of his, uh, or the re remains of his party, who had unsuccessfully raced to the South Pole. So, wow, th there's a lot there. And the ones I'm going to be covering, I'm going to touch on one or two of those, but let me tell you what's coming up. And then I'm going to get into the chat and just do the general uh, housekeeping stuff. All right. So um, things we're going to touch on this week. I'm going to do a little bit about Easter in a moment. Not the not the Bible bit, but some stuff from English history. OK, um, we've got Scotland. Robert the Bruce, Robert Bruce, Robert I of Scotland, because this week saw him crowned in 1306, also saw the Battle of Berwick in uh, 1299 and the sacking of Berwick two days later in this week. 
Um, so we've got that. Uh, Cecil Rhodes died. Now, that's a controversial, you know, let's face it, I go to places that some historians don't like to go to on YouTube. And um, so let's talk a little bit about Cecil Rhodes, only briefly. But uh, And then the last one, we will talk about the Battle of Toton, uh, England's bloodiest battle in the Wars of the Roses. So how's that? How's that for a bit of a uh, an agenda for today? I might just touch on the Battle of Hobani. Um, oh, and, and maybe the Battle of Margate. And I don't mean mods versus rockers, OK? Uh, this is one from the Hundred Years' War. So we've got a bit of medieval stuff going on today, haven't we? But um, that's just the way history falls, isn't it? So um, so hello to everyone. I just saw um, QA Library, a uh, great supporter. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice you finished jury service after seven weeks. Uh, they said it would only be a three-week thing. Yeah. Uh, so, well, hats off to you for doing it. Uh, I don't know who else has ever done jury service. I... I I had the, I'll be honest, I had the misfortune of doing it. It was as boring as ditch water, but, uh, and I got released after a week. So don't want to rub it in, Kerry Library, but yeah, but we all do our bit, don't we? Um, Leslie, lovely to see you as well. Uh, Sarah Jane, hello. Uh, Chris Warren, Darren, nice to see you. Where we've got Uncle Harry from Northamptonshire. Um, QA Library, you phoned a friend about the Royal Navy question and hit up the Twitter. Great. And I'll ask you to, I'll ask you to maybe just put something in the chat about that in a moment because I I noticed something in in on YouTube. Okay, um, Jen Ingle from Cumbria. Hopefully, Jen, it is nice weather up there today. Don't know. Uh, we've got a bit of sun here in Worcester. Hallelujah. Um, Shrewsbury, nice to see you as well. Uh, that's uh, who's that? That's Fre um, oh Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Do beg your pardon, uh, Fred Russell. Lovely to see you, uh, David from Nagasaki in uh, Japan or Nagasaki Prefecture in Japan. Lovely to see you. Thanks for your comments yesterday, uh, yesterday and uh, your email that you sent me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Balfour Declaration wasn't going to do that today, Hashim, but um, but uh, yeah, if um, you never know, we might do that. William Wallace, he is going to get a mention, Hashim. Yes, uh, but maybe not quite the William Wallace that uh, Braveheart, uh, the film Braveheart said. But I, I can't resist having a knock at the film Braveheart. But um, good film, just historically nowhere near the truth. But hey, you know, a lot of us here are fans of Zulu. And let's be honest, there's more holes in Zulu than a piece of, che uh, a piece of uh, Swiss cheese, isn't there? Um Easter Uprising, wasn't going to touch that this week, but thank you very much, David. Lord Milner became his successor. Sorry, I've got a bit of a... I've got a little bit of a frog in my throat there. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, Mike in Harden, up in um, Deeside, Deeside, uh, North Wales, just across the border from Cheshire. And, of course, Harden, the home of William Gladstone, uh, and a great library there, of course, Gladstone's Library. Any of you ever go past Harden, North Wales, uh, the Gladstone Library is open to the public. It's amazing. Uh, it's his private. It was his collection of books. And this man, uh, he basically ate books for breakfast. He, he and he, he read them in sort of ancient Greek, ancient Latin, or ancient Latin, in Latin. Um, a, a fascinating character, um, not necessarily a prime minister you would have warmed to you know we i've got a thing when i lived up in cheshire we used to say you know, would who who would be on your barbecue list who would you have around for a barbecue in the back garden and we went through some of the prime ministers going back and uh yeah we 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 i, th I think people thought tony blair would be all right as a barbecue but he'd bring his wife um we thought maggie would come and tell you how to do the barbecue um, I think we actually thought in the end of it all, we thought we thought actually <laughs> Gordon Brown was probably Gordon Brown and John Major were probably the two easiest people to have at your barbecue. Anyway, don't believe William Gladstone would have been an easy man to have at your barbecue. Um, and certainly Queen Victoria was never a fan of him. She much preferred Benjamin Disraeli, not least because he used to butter her up and you know, play on her ego. Whereas I think Gladstone used to have a reasonably low opinion of Queen Victoria and realised he was far brighter than her. But you don't necessarily need to rub that into people, do you? Hashim, Benjamin Disraeli could have read more books than Gladstone. He may have. Um, what he didn't do was donate or, or open his whole library up to the general public. So uh, the Gladstone Library at Harden, by the way, uh, Hashim, is, is, is amazing because you can go in, you can actually handle the books that Gladstone personally read. 
And if you flick through some of them, you'll see he's written notes. He, he used to write all over his books. And there are notes from Gladstone in his own pen in these books. It's a real sort of feeling like you're walking in the in the steps of history or turning the pages of history in that case. Um, golly, we're, we're on a real roll here. So just as a housekeeping, folks, please keep writing in the chat. So I'll keep coming back to you. And of course, those of you who've not been on one of these calls before, um, this is not, as you probably guessed already, is not like my normal videos that I do. My main videos that I do, one a week, maybe two a week if I'm very lucky, uh, they tend to be really well researched, really well scripted. I mean, I spend the best part of the day writing the scripts, um, the recording and editing, all the lovely images. This is just me talking, like if we were meeting in a pub or in a coffee shop or something. OK, so a little bit more free flowing. And the great thing is you can join in, which you can't do in my uh, on my normal videos. I know people can post comments. And thank you to everyone who does post comments as well. Uh, YouTube like comments. There's a thing in the YouTube algorithm, just one little bit of the YouTube algorithm, OK? Um, it likes the sense of community. And it sees community as uh, people who give, give it a like, people who share it with other people, and people who comment. OK, so uh, by all means, comment, even if it's a great video, Chris. YouTube like that. Okay. So, but um, I genuinely actually read all the comments that come through. I'll be honest, if you're nasty about me, they get binned. If you're racist, they get binned. And if you're anti British, they get binned as well, normally. Um, don't mind people having opinions. It's how they express the opinions that worries me more. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, this is it. So, free flowing, a bit of, you know, history jazz. And um, we'll be over and done with by two o'clock. Hopefully, because not least because Sarah, Sarah's not too impressed that on a uh, on a holiday day, as it is in her life today, uh, that I am I'm chatting to all you lot. So, OK, um, yeah, we, we all have to keep we all have to keep on the good side sometimes, don't we? You all got to help me keep on the good side of Sarah. So I might not answer all of your questions. All right. So um, so let me just quick look, quick look over there uh, into the chats. Blimey, we're going absolutely mad. Zulu War History. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chris. Hello to you too, mate. Uh, Sarah Jane. Yes, thank thank you very much, Sarah Jane, that you you sent uh, you sent a link about a friend who was in Starlag Three in the Great Escape. Um, so thank you very much. Um, David's joined us from Spain. I bet the weather's nicer in Spain. Hey, I tell you what, everyone, I don't know what it's like here, uh, where you are, but great. Well, it's sun is shining. And I always think Good Friday, sun shines. I've got happy memories from when I was growing up. Do you remember the old days when everything used to stop at, at midday? I used to work at Fine Fair in, in Wheat Hampstead in Hertfordshire. That was my Saturday job or Saturday and some evenings. And Good Fridays, we used to shut at lunchtime. And we all used to go to the pub and sit in the pub garden. And... I'm sure we only ever did it probably, you know, probably only two years I did it. And I've got happy memories of it always being sunny in those pub gardens. Maybe it was. Maybe I've just got selective memory. Don't we all? Hey, um, but um, and let's kick off with a bit of Easter, because actually yesterday we had uh, Queen Camilla was in Worcester. She was at Worcester Cathedral. Uh, giving out the Maundy money at the Maundy service. And this is a tradition that goes back a long time. I won't go into it in too, too great detail, but um, on Maundy Thursday, the Thursday, the day before, the Thursday before Good Friday uh, in, the, in the Christian calendar, uh, she, uh, the, the kings, kings or queens of England have traditionally handed out these Maundy money, Maundy coins, pennies and some others uh, in little purses, leather purses uh, to, uh, when I say purses, more like, um, more like the medieval money belt sort of things. We're not talking purses that you clip clip shut, but more like the sort of thing you'd have seen you know, Robin Hood wearing on his belt, but that sort of thing. And um, yeah, this is a tradition. It actually dates right back into Anglo-Saxon times that it used to happen in the church, that uh, the needy would be given things on, uh, you know, on goodies on, on Maundy Thursday. And it sort of got adopted during the Middle Ages in England that the monarchs would start to give out to the needy as well. Uh, actually, it was all part of the Christian thing about uh, um, love one another from the from the, the Christian gospel. And so um, kings, the kings of England, and they were kings in the Middle Ages, uh, they used to wash the feet of, uh, feet of the poor and give them clothing and and other charitable donations. By the 1660s, didn't happen during Oliver Cromwell's time. Yeah, yeah. 
traditional killjoy. But uh, by the 1660s, Charles II back on the throne, and that's when he started dishing out the money. He in and funny enough, the the washing of the poor's feet, you know, Baldrick from Blackadder, you, you, that stopped quite soon, and so did the giving out of clothes and food, and it just became traditional money. These and they're specially minted by the Royal Mint now. The, these uh, coins. And they're given out, uh, traditionally, they're given out to the number of elderly parishioners in a diocese uh, that corresponds to the age of the monarch. So this year, it was, was it 73, 74 uh, people, uh, the age of King Charles III, okay? Uh, obviously, he wasn't there. I believe he sent a televised message, but Queen Camilla was there. And these, they're, they're the elderly, and basically they are people who have been good churchgoers. Uh, that's a Chris Green way. I, I think the church and the Buckingham Palace probably have a slightly finer way of saying it. But so this is not the great and the good. This is not your local councillors, members of parliament, uh, David Beckham, or uh, whatever, being given these morning points. This is really, um, yeah, the, these are for just people who've been good parishioners. And that's, that dates right back into, well, Middle Ages as far as the monarchs doing it, but as a tradition in England, right back to Saxon times. And Good Friday. I thought I would uh, just uh, finish off. Well, you can see I'm supping my coffee. Yes. It's, but I've also got my hot cross bun. Only ever have those, actually, on Good Friday. Don't, don't eat them any other time of the year or any other time at Easter, actually. But again, one of those traditions I have, uh, eating a hot cross bun. And... Hot cross buns, again, long history, uh, buns and, and things like that were, were, were baked from, from Roman times with those changes of seasons, marking changes of seasons. The hot cross bun, this sort of bun with spices and fruit on it and this cross. Can you see sort of a flowery cross there? Um, they were first started, actually, at St. Albans Abbey in Hertfordshire in the 1360s, where a monk basically made buns slightly different to these and i'll explain why in a minute but uh, he made monk, uh, buns which he would give out to the uh, to the poor uh, and the parishioners who came to the the the, the abbey and the monastery of saint albans uh, in on good friday and he, the alban bun which is actually a closely guarded secret it's, it was actually the precursor of these the alban bun was just a normal bread roll and instead of having this little uh, this is like a flour and paste flour paste cross okay on the top uh, the alban bun actually they, they cut it actually cut it cut the dough so as the as the bread bakes the alban bun breaks it almost bursts open the only way i could describe it so it looks a little bit like a a little bit like a jacket potato when it opens up that's probably a really bad description but um 1360s started off in saint albans obviously they kept the uh, the abbey of saint albans kept it a really closely guarded secret as to how they made their buns and what was in it. So elsewhere in England, other people liked the idea of these and they started making their own. And <laughs> the hot cross bun overtook the Alban bun and that's what people now know. So I can imagine the, the monks now must probably, well, they'd probably fall over if they went down the local aisle of Sainsbury's or Tesco and saw the amount of hot cross buns and the different varieties of hot cross buns. But they were a genuine, a genuine religious thing from the religious houses. And don't forget the, the abbeys and the monasteries of England in the in the Middle Ages were incredibly, incredibly uh, rich and powerful. And indeed, actually, the, the monastery at St. Albans was attacked 20 years later during the Peasants' Revolt. Uh, so they were not only rich and powerful, but also seemed very unpopular. And, and, and trust me, the things we sometimes maybe talk about with the, the Roman Catholic Church at the moment and some of the, the dealings with the, the, the Vatican Bank and all those things. Um, yeah, that's how a lot of English people did view the monasteries. Uh, they definitely didn't see them. Not everyone saw them as uh, houses of houses of learning and and Christian love. They were major landowners. And if you were a tenant or had to pay them, you probably hated them as much as the American colonists hated paying taxes in the 1760s and 1770s. So there you go. So that's a little bit. That's a bit. Of turn. I told you, folks, we go off piste. You know, we started already. Let me just see. QA Library. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that kind donation. That's very nice of you to hit the, is it the super super chat or the super button below. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <laughs> David from Kyushu, Cromwell's a killjoy, and here I was thinking you just killed kings. Oh yes, I think that's a bit tongue in cheek, but uh, but uh, uh, Cromwell, very interesting person actually, 
very interesting person. Um, not not necessarily, again, not necessarily someone you'd have at your barbecue. He'd probably be up there with 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 Gladstone. Uh, Winston Churchill's mum had a great quote about Gladstone and Disraeli, and and, um, and she said, "Was it that?" Uh, when you were with Gladstone, you knew you were talking. You were with the most uh, most intelligent man in Britain, uh, or the greatest man in Britain. When you talked to Disraeli, you felt you were the greatest woman in Britain. Um, so probably he used that style with Queen Victoria as well. Uh, Kieran's the coins are very small. My, my wife has some given to her aunt maybe twenty years ago. Oh, fascinating! Thank you very much. That's the Maldi money we're talking about. Thank you. Uncle Heavy, did you know that bun means something very rude in Danish? No, I didn't. Um, here we go. It's Good Friday, isn't it? Uh, let me just have a quick look here. <laughs> Terry Murphy, we still hate paying, t hate, hate paying taxes. Um, I think most people do, haven't they? It's one of those things. Um, and I was thinking earlier, and I will do this at some stage, the, the power of the monasteries in medieval England most people think it's something to do with the Normans, and, and sure as hell, it, it, it really it really went to town with the Normans. But the power of the monasteries had really started growing from, from during the Anglo-Saxon period, and Anglo-Saxon England, especially the latter part, where, where it became almost like England, uh, rather than the, the early Dark Ages part of Anglo-Saxon England, um, be, became a really stratified society, and the landowners, including the church, had all the power. And just like, you know, and this is one of these things about history, isn't it? It doesn't really change. Those with power and money wanted to keep it, wanted to get more of it, and sure as hell didn't want anyone else climbing the ladder. They wanted to keep the club to themselves and to those they knew. And um, and and Anglo-Saxon so uh, society was very stratified. By the time we got to uh, Aethelred the Unread, uh, King Aethelred, Edward the Confessor, and indeed uh, Harold, uh, for his one year that he was, well, less than one year that he was king. Um, yeah, the power power lay in the hands of very, very few, very rich, almost like oligarchs, like the Russian oligarchs. And this, this, there's a bit of a myth, a national myth, that when the Normans came, you know, happy little England had been going along and everyone was dancing around maypoles and then the, the Norman yoke was put on it. Uh, if you actually look, you know, slavery existed. Slavery existed in Anglo-Saxon England. And we're not talking about black slaves. We're talking about actually Anglo-Saxons were slaved. So uh, very stratified society uh, and fascinating. I find it. I might do some talks about Anglo-Saxon England at some stage in the future. There you go. Um, right. Let's kick off with a story from British history this week. And let me kick off with Scotland. And in particular, the 20 or well, two, two well, actually three events that happened this week, actually, in Scottish history. So on the... 25th, I'll do them in chronal, uh, sorry, in date order or day order, okay, and then I'll tell the overall story. So 25th of March, 1306, Robert Bruce, Robert the Bruce, was proclaimed King Robert I of Scotland, okay, bear that one in mind. 28th of March, 1296, the Battle of Berwick, English invading Scotland, and two days later, the 30th of March, uh, 1296, the storming and sacking of Berwick, the town. Um, so let me just put this into some sort of thing, because most folk don't know. It never ceases, ceases to amaze me, actually, how little history of this island most people who live on this island actually really know. Uh, and there's a lot of it, let's be honest. So, um, so I can't blame the teachers for not teaching every little bit but um, it's, it is quite fascinating. And most people don't know much about Robert Bruce. And if we know anything, it's because he, you know, watched a spider spinning his web. And, um, and we know there's Bannockburn, because if you're Scottish and if you're English, you prefer to forget about it. And you'll also know that all your Scottish friends will remind you of Bannockburn. You will hear a flower of Scotland being sung at the rugby internationals by the Scottish fans, that is. And... Um, and uh, and no one really knows much more about it. Oh, and Braveheart. Um, yeah, Hashim said it earlier, didn't he? <laughs> that we, you know, William Wallace. So let me just try and put this little bit of history into context for you. Scotland and England, two independent countries. The English and Scots nobility and the, the royal families intermarried. 
Okay, so so the idea that they were mutually exclusive in the higher echelons was not true. Um, Robert Bruce had lands in England, okay, uh, as as a landlord in England, um, but um, so so fundamentally, you had a lot of vested interests, vested family interests. In the twelve nineties, the um, in the twelve ninety in the twelve nineties, uh, there was a vacancy on the Scottish throne. Could go into a lot more detail. I won't at the moment. Okay, but there, there was a period called the Interregnum. No one knew who could be the King of Scotland. This is when um, King Alexander died, uh, and uh, basically the Scots didn't know who to pick. About thirteen people put through their hats in the ring, saying, "Oh yeah, I'd have a go," including the King of Norway, because I, I think he got to the stage where actually he was he was the father of um, Margaret, maid of maid of Norway, who was on the her way. To become Queen of Scotland at the beginning of this interregnum, she was like the last the last direct descendant of Alexander uh, when he died. And she was only three years old, something like that. And anyway, she was finally being sent by her father. She was she was the grandchild of Alexander. And um, she was finally being allowed by her father to go to Norway. He wasn't sorry, from Norway to Scotland. He wasn't very keen because girls didn't inherit the throne in medieval Britain unless unless it really there was no alternative. And we know, those of us know our history, young children tend to get bossed around and manipulated, not just on Scottish and English thrones across Europe. So uh, King Eric of Norway wasn't very keen on her coming across. She actually, he eventually, he allowed her to leave, to go to Scotland, and would you believe she died en route? And now, now that's when the interregnum really swung in, because now uh, even the girl had gone, and they were floundering around looking. They actually went up the closest... The closest two um, claimants, and as I say, there were about 13 who stuck the, 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 the names in the frame, including King Eric of Norway, because he basically said, well, you know, if lots of these nobles from Scotland who've got an inch of blue blood in them are going to uh, put, put to, uh, are going to uh, throw the hat in the ring, why not me? My daughter was going to be the Queen of Scotland a few moments ago until she died. They actually had to go up to the grandfather, uh, gr the grandfather of Alexander. OK, so we're talking several generations back, rather like if King Charles died now, having to go up to George V and seeing what descendants of his brothers and sisters were still around. And that and there and, and those were the two best candidates. OK, uh, there were uh, go, going down that side uh, from two different sisters. We had a man called John Balliol and a man called uh, Robert Bruce. John Bay so basically the Scots when you when you had that that slightly <laughs> slightly dodgy um claim to the throne. And I don't mean dodgy in the sense they were they didn't have a claim, it was just like they were very shaky, you know. That was the best, they were the best too. And we had Eric, you know, and, and others throwing the hats in the ring. No one could really see that there was an obvious candidate, although it looked like John Balliol and Robert Bruce were the two best candidates. So Robert, uh, sorry, um the king who died, Alexander, was the brother-in-law of Edward I. In other words, he'd married Edward I of England's sister. Edward I, you might know as the man who you know, built the castles in Wales, snuffed out Welsh independence, or at least in, in North Welsh independence, what was left of it. And uh, they, the, he basically said, well, look, I will call a parliament and I will, I will help you. This is Edward I Longshanks' style of helping, but uh, I will help you decide who should be the king of Scotland. And he came down on the side that what they called a Scottish Parliament. A lot of Scottish nobles came to York, and basically, um, under under his stewardship, Edward the First stewardship, they chose John Balliol ahead of Robert Bruce. He actually hoped that John Balliol would be a yeah a puppet king. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. He didn't necessarily want to rule Scotland, but he sure as heck wanted to have influence in Scotland. And Balliol, Balliol owed him one. He wouldn't be on the throne if Edward I hadn't manipulated that Scottish Parliament in York. John Balliol had other plans, and not only did he refuse to count out to Edward I, but he went one step further. He actually formed an alliance with France. It's the beginning of the old alliance, which was very much in France and, and Scotland's, but most certainly France's interest. France and England obviously were constantly at loggerheads in France. And um, uh, the French realised that a great way of having an advantage in France 
would be if the English had to have half their army up on the northern border <laughs> waiting for an invasion from Scotland. And, and likewise, if the Scots were ever in real trouble with the English, uh, like John Balliol was about to create by ignoring Edward I, always useful to have a French army rampaging through the English lands in France. And you need to send your army down across the channel to France. So the old alliance. Basically, um, uh, Edward, Edward was not impressed. And But uh, look, cutting a long story short, John Balliol was forced off the throne. He was forced to abdicate. He actually ended up, he, he had lands in France, came down through England, uh, went to Dover and went off to his lands in France. And now there was a period in Scotland where, again, there was no king. And Edward started to uh, exert more and more power. And this is where the uprising of William Wallace came in. OK, and this is real. This is real. Uh, yeah. English Scottish history 1.0. OK, I appreciate some of you are experts in Scottish history and you're probably cringing at the moment and thinking, why am I not saying about this and that and the other? William Wallace raised rebellion and um, in 1298, Edward had had enough and invaded Scotland. And at, uh, at the 28th of March, 1296, he defeated the Scots at the Battle of Berwick. Berwick was just inside Scotland at the time and was also the main port of Scotland at the time. Two days later, his army stormed the town of Berwick or the port of Berwick and killed, well, estimates anywhere between four and 17,000 civilians were killed in the sacking of Berwick. Uh, and he read really, that because, uh, yeah, he was going to teach the Scots a lesson. And, and Berwick had held out against him when he had told them to surrender, and they hadn't. So, um, and that was the, the beginning, the first battle of what's turned to the Scottish, uh, the first Scottish War of Independence, which trundled on. Uh, obviously, we had uh, the Battle of Stirling Bridge, a victory for the Scots. Uh, we then had uh, the Battle of Falkirk, where William Wallace was severely defeated. And uh, William Wallace ultimately was captured and taken to London, where he was hung, drawn and quartered. Or hanged, drawn and quartered, sorry, um, the, as a traitor. So um, long story short, we now really didn't know who the hell was going to be the leader of Scotland. But in 1306, 12th, 25th of March, 1306, Robert Bruce had gathered enough support in Scotland to realise that he was, on a, he was not going to be opposed by another John Balliol. Uh, his only problem was the English. But he uh, he was proclaimed King of Scotland. At, I think he was proclaimed at Schoon. I, I, I stand to be corrected on that one. Uh, on the 25th of March, 1306. And the history continued. That he lost his, he ultimately he lost a war with Edward. Edward took the stone of Schoon, the traditional st uh, st stone that the kings of Scotland, and indeed the Pictish kings, had sat on to be crowned. He took that down to London. To Westminster Abbey, where it remained until mm, about 20 years ago. It's back in Scotland now, uh, on the agreement that uh, it would be brought to, to Westminster Abbey for future coronations and then go back to Scotland. Of course, that defeat, when uh, when Bruce was defeated, that's when Bruce supposedly ran to the Western Isles and saw the spider spinning his web. And, you know, that whole thing about if you don't succeed at first, try, try, try again. The try again, ultimately, for Robert Bruce was the good news was that um, Edward, Edward was coming up to Scotland again because the Scottish re resistance hadn't died out just because Robert Bruce was in a cave. And um, he came up again, but he died en route. And he was succeeded by his son, Edward II. Edward II was anything. He was the polar opposite of his father. I've mentioned him recently, of course, because he recently, um, a few weeks ago, he died at Barclay Castle. Uh, in Gloucestershire, but um, Edward II uh, was defeated by Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn. There we go. Um, so for all my English fans, now you can see why sometimes the Scots have a bit of a beef, eh? and also why they're very proud of uh, some of their victories over the English as well. Uh, which just reminds me, actually, that on uh, England, Scotland, let's not forget Flower of Scotland, um, 20, where the heck are we? 27th of March. 1871, the first ever rugby international between England and Scotland. Or should I actually say between Scotland and England? It was actually played at um, Rayburn Park in Edinburgh. So not not at, uh, not just, just playing fields. And in fact, funny enough, Rayburn Park, they still play rugby at Rayburn Park. 
but it's just like playing fields. There's no stadiums or anything there. And uh, it was a victory to the Scots. The Scots won the very first Scotland-England Rugby International in 1871. So there you go. Flower of Scotland. And just to prove I don't do just English history all the time. Love Welsh history as well. Big challenge with Welsh history. Pronouncing the names. Right. Let me see how everyone's doing over here on the, in, in the chat. So sorry about that. Let's, let's see where we're at. Um, Did the machine? Did those landowners have had special upper class accents? I think we're talking about the Anglo Saxons. I don't know. I would think they probably did, of a fashion. Yeah. Um, I live near Minster Abbey in Thanet. Ah, oh, and that goes right back. You're absolutely right, uh, Tasha. Yes, it does. And um, uh, Minster Minster has a great history. Won't do it now, as you can tell. I can ramble for England, can't I? Um, Robert Bruce had land in North, lands in North Yorkshire. Yes, he did. And of course, John Balliol had lands that his family came from England. In fact, Balliol College in at, uh, Cam uh, at Cambridge, e Oxford. Oh, God, I'm going mad. Balliol College it was founded by the Balliol family. OK, so they were they were that into England at the time. Uh, Hammer of the Scots, Edward the First. Yes, that's what he, he was called. Um <laughs> Thank you. Bruce was crowned king. He was indeed, Don. Yes, he was crowned king uh, of Scotland. Uh, and, of course, our royal family now, the British royal family, can trace their tree back to Robert Bruce uh, and indeed higher. Uh, right back in the same way that, uh, and it's fascinating, actually, that the, the current royal family, if you follow the line, actually can trace their lineage back into the House of Wessex, Alfred the Great, and indeed before, and equally, they can trace their lineage back into Scotland before 1066 um, with uh, Malcolm Canmore and, um, and, and going, going beyond as well. So, um, and, and um, Duncan, his father, Duncan, who was killed by Macbeth, real, real king of Scotland, Macbeth. Um, we've got a bit of banter going on here. Uh, which is absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Do you know, it would be good, wouldn't it? Could you imagine if we were all sitting in a pub or in a coffee house or something and just able to have this this sort of chinwag? Martin Hill, welcome as a new Waterloo member in my members channel. Thank you very much. Um, really grateful to all the people who are members, by the way, um, because some of you will have seen in last night's video that I did a, a first ever sponsorship. And... Um, yeah, someone said to me, oh, Chris, you know, did you have to? The, the answer is, you know, this history chap stuff takes a bit of time. I'm, I'm not, not bleating. You can tell I love it. Uh, both both the history chap and reading history. Sarah said to me recently, she said, if you retired, what would you do? And I said, well, um, I would probably read a lot of history books and visit a lot of history places and probably bore you telling you everything I read, Sarah. And she goes, well, so really like, like you do now then. So, um, but... Love it, but I need to pay the bills, okay? And if everyone was a member, I mean, I have about a million viewers a month on YouTube, which is bonkers. Uh, if everyone was a member, uh, <laughs> I'd be a very rich man, wouldn't I? But seriously, if people would join my membership ch channel, then then I, would, then I wouldn't be taking sponsorship. It's as simple as that. But in the meantime, needs must, okay, folks? Um, anyway, um, where are we? Question was cricket, integral part of Victorian era England. Uh, Hashim, uh, that's a really good question. Was cricket an integral part of Victorian era England? Don't know the answer, but here's my two penneth worth. I think it was an integral part of the public schools. I don't cricket by its very nature. Uh, you need a bit of space, okay? And it was not a particularly working class. From what I can tell, it was definitely not a working class game. Certainly not a working class game in the in the big industrial cities. I think in, in rural areas, it actually probably was played. But fundamentally, in Victorian Britain, I would suggest to you that cricket was very much the uh, played in the public schools. And that is why, with those public school officers, civil servants, administrators, as they went around the world with the British Empire, 
that's how cricket was taken taken into places not not least but places like India and, and Pakistan um, was by those people the products of the English public schools. Okay, but anyone else, please chime in. But that's my yeah. You know, I, I would say football was principally the uh, you know, rugby and cricket principally the sports of the public schools. You know, Eton's Charterhouse, Harrow, uh, football, the game of the masses. Um, initially, public schools played football as well. First FA Cup was won by a public school football team, but um, by the by the mid eighteen eighties, uh, it had become very much a working class sport. Um, Stuart, I can't quite get. What about Michael Edward Abney Hastings, the real King of England, or not? Is he the guy that's down in Australia? Is that right, Stuart? Uh, if you just join in, that'd be great. It's a shame we don't have this two-way chat, isn't it? Because you could just say, no, rubbish. Uh, Charlie Manson, the landowners back then would have had French accents, most likely. Uh, not when they were Anglo-Saxon, obviously, but when, they were, when the Norman Conquest came, most certainly, virtually all the land. It was the biggest, uh, after 1066, it was the biggest land redistribution England has ever had, okay? Um, th th virtually no Anglo-Saxon aristocracy, nobles, landowners uh, kept land. But by the time the Doomsday Book was written, it was all owned by the church, the king, and the, and the King William, William I, William the Conqueror's uh, uh, acolytes, and virtually no Anglo-Saxons owned, owned land anymore. And even at the back end of the Anglo-Saxon period, there were there were Norman nobles and Norman abbots of monasteries because Edward the Confessor was quite pro-Norman, and um, uh, so yeah, there would have been even in late Anglo-Saxon period, some would have been, had French accents or Norman accents, and sure as heck afterwards. Um, Stuart Pendrell says yes. Okay, I, I don't know too much about Michael Edward Abney Hastings, but. Um, there was a program, and I can't. Who the heck did it? Was it? Wasn't it um, Tony Robinson, Baldrick uh, from from Time Team, and Baldrick from Blackadder? I think he did this one where they they traced. I think it must be back to Edward the uh, Third, and they basically suggested there is an alternative royal family in England. Um, don't know too much about it. And the gentleman down in Australia doesn't seem to be pressing his claim too much. Probably enjoys dining out on the fact uh, of, of the story. And is probably quite happy not to be in a, um, yes, high pressure uh, goldfish bowl that being a member of the English royal family or British royal family is. Okay. Uh, Stuart, you treat it, with, treat, treat it with a pinch of salt. Yeah, I would too. But a great story, you know, and I do remember watching it. And, and Tony, I do remember it, and I thought Tony Robinson did a really good job on it as well, actually. Um, right, okay. Uh, Richard Hogg up from Brum, thank you. Uh, yep, you're absolutely right. First Castle, yeah, was pre Norman. You're absolutely correct. Uh, obviously, taken from Norman, they, they were copying the Normans because of Norman influence in England pre 1066. I say people don't necessarily realize that. Uh, and David from Japan saying, uh, the long lost member of the English royal family, he's in Australia, he's escaped the English weather, and, and good luck to him as well. So let me take you on the next step of English history or British history. Uh, what happened this week? You're going to love this one. 25th of March, 1807, the slave trade is banned in the British Empire. <laughs> the... Obviously, uh, let, let, let's be absolutely honest. Uh, this, and let's just get this right. This is the slave trade, not the ownership of slaves. That continued. But the slave trade. Since the 1660s, the English and then the British had been highly active in the transatlantic slave trade. And I think there's a really good... I don't know if anyone's been to the Maritime Museum in Liverpool, but they've got a really good section on the slave trade. And obviously Liverpool's role in the slave trade, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, fascinating. And fascinating, obviously quite horrific, but also fascinating as well, just to, it points out that at different times, whilst the British played a significant role in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, lots of other nations were at it as well. We tend to forget that uh, inside our British goldfish bowl, when we talk about slavery and it's bad, and let's be honest, it is bad. Um, but uh, the, the British, they've been at it since the 1660s with the Royal Africa Company, which indeed had 
uh, royal patronage. Uh, the Duke of York, who later James II, was a key player. Uh, indeed, Prince Rupert of uh, the English Civil War fame, he was a major shareholder in the Royal Africa Company as well. Royal Africa Company's raison d'etre was basically to go to the west coast of Africa and trade in gold, ivory and slaves. And it found that obviously slaves were much better, uh, were, were much more profitable than the other two, and much more abundant. Um, and as I say, the British were, were heavily involved in the transatlantic slave trade. It's estimated that British ships carried something like three million slaves from West Africa across the Atlantic to South America, Central America, the Caribbean and North America. Very often, not, not just to British colonies or the what were then the future United States, but often taking them to other, other colonies too, other places too, like Brazil, which was owned by the Portuguese. Uh, but what's interesting, and people forget this, is, oh, sorry, don't forget it. We sort of don't focus on it. Is um, Britain only get the silver medal, and three million, and someone else actually shipped more slaves across the, the, the Atlantic than the Brits? The Portuguese. 3.8 million, it's estimated. Uh, people were taken from West Africa. West Africa basically take it from Angola up through Africa to Gambia, that sort of sense most of the west coast of Africa. Um, yeah, the Portuguese, 3.8 million versus the British, 3 million. Uh, then uh, lagging quite a way behind in the bronze medal position were the French, with a mere 1.3 million souls carried across the Atlantic. Um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, slavery didn't just exist on the transatlantic slave trade, okay, there was the Barbary pirates, and I've done a, I've done a video about the Barbary pirates. That that that's had that's had some comments. I can assure you, at both ends of the spectrum, um, but, but the Barbary pirates, uh, the trans the Trans-Saharan slave trade, the uh, the slave trade across to Arabia, the slave trade through East Africa, run by uh, principally the Omanis, who had then taken over the Sultanate of Zanzibar, and of course I've done a, a story about the shortest war in the world. Uh, which was the, uh, uh, the the British war in Zanzibar, where they were trying to stop, stamp out the slave trade by then. But anyway, um, having having done all this, I mean, basically, since about the 1770s, there'd been a growing debate in Britain about the slave trade. And indeed, the first ever, in 1776, there was a, a, a um, uh, debate in Parliament where the slave trade was described as contrary to the laws of God and the rights of man. So, uh, and you know, a variety of pamphleteers, some ex-slaves living in Britain, uh, took up the calls and were, were very vociferous. Obviously, we talked about power earlier, okay, power and money, and how power and money people don't like to, they, they pull up the ladder behind them. A bit hard to break into the club. Sure as heck was in Anglo-Saxon times, Norman times, and it still was in the 1700s. So all very well to be a, an ex-black slave uh, saying that slavery is wrong and preaching to people in churches and that saying this is what happened to me as a slave and people were aghast. But you needed Parliament to do something and Parliament was made up of white men, men, not women. And um, of course, that's where William Wilberforce in particular came into the equation uh, as one of the as one of the leading lights in the anti-slavery uh, debates in Parliament. Uh, and, you know, he was he took up the cudgels in, in he, over, for over 20 years. Um, he was involved in the slave, in the slave debates in, in Parliament. I say, first debate was 1776. Finally, in 1807, um, uh, it was uh, the, the on the, wherever we are, sorry, 25th of March, 1807, the slave, uh, an act was passed in Parliament outlawing the slave trade. In other words, British ships could no longer carry slaves. Uh, it made law on the 1st of May, 1807. And then other nations started to follow. 1808, Congress in the USA um, banned the trade, the again, the transportation of slaves to America. In both cases, in both the British Empire and, and the USA by that stage, owning slaves in places like the Caribbean, in places like the Southern States of America, was not outlawed, okay? Purely the transportation of slaves from Africa. So we're not augmenting it. Obviously, slavery existed in other countries, not least the Portuguese continued doing it. In fact, actually, even when Brazil went independent, slavery wasn't outlawed in Brazil until the 1880s. Slavery in the British Empire was ultimately outlawed in the 1830s. 
uh, but it took so it took nearly thirty years from the from the outlawing of the trade in slaves to slavery to actually be abolished in the British Empire. But this was the first nail in the coffin of the slavery in the British Empire, uh, and of course uh, didn't stop people trying to smuggle st slaves. And as I say, people like the Portuguese and the Brazilians were were were. were keen to keep slaves trade going, as were people like Zanzibar over on the east coast of Africa. Uh, and suddenly the Royal Navy was now used to actually intercept those ships. And uh, we established in particular the Royal Navy, uh, sorry, the West Africa Squadron of the Royal Navy, who were boarding ships, both British ships and others, freeing slaves uh, in, on the Atlantic route. And actually they, they freed, I can't remember the figure off my top of my head, but 300,000 rings a bell that the the West Africa squadron freed during its sort of 70-year operation, which compared to 3 million is reasonably small, isn't it? But I guess for those 300,000 people they they rescued, it was a big deal. Um, it's like that story about the, the, the little boy throwing, there's all jellyfish, oh, sorry, um, starfish on a beach and um, this little boy is going along and he's picking them up throwing them in one by one and this man comes along and says well um you're not going to make any difference there's so many starfish on the beach you're not going to make any difference and the little boy picked picked another starfish up and threw it in the sea and said well it made a difference to that one didn't it sometimes you know we can't all change the world but we can change individual individual people's worlds can't we there you go um where are we at Colin H, was that part of the Great Reform Act of 1832? I'm guessing you're talking about the, the abolition of slavery. No, it wasn't, Colin. Um, abolition of slavery happened a few years afterwards, but that was a whole period in the 1830s, 1840s, where, uh, yeah, Parliament was finally stepping up and moving into, I call it a modern era, where things like slavery were being outlawed, where, where, um, where the franchise was being extended to more and more men. In Britain took a long time Britain's road to democracy but yeah thank you very much um just clicking back here the last part of slavery in the UK was not stopped until laws passed in early 2000 is that right QA library I've been to your judgment I've been to your knowledge on that one I certainly know that um uh the compensation that was given to slave owners when slavery itself was repealed uh, it took a long time to be repaid. Hmm. Clark Bent, uh, love to imagine the Royal Navy pulling up. Must have been an awe-inspiring sight. Yeah, um, and, and people forget the West. You know, the West Africa trade was all right. A little bit like reform smokers. I, I get it. Um, the, the Brits were now suddenly championing the freedom of people. But do you know what? You know, there was a time where we all thought that you know diesel cars were great as well. Uh, we all thought that maybe power stations burning coal were great. Uh, and I think people have a right to change an opinion and then have strong a, a new strong opinion. But um, so there you go. Uh, expat, expat. A lot of slaves seized by the British Navy were held on St. Helena. Yeah. Uh, yes, they were. And of course, St. Helena had had a long history of, of, of slave ownership as well. A uh, fascinating, fascinating little island out there in the Atlantic. And of course, uh, another place, I mean, famous because it became uh, St. Helena, still a British overseas territory to this day, but famous because it became um, the large prison of Napoleon Bonaparte after his defeat at Waterloo in 1815. Equally, it became a prison camp for many Boers after the, uh, during the Boer War, the Second Boer War, 1880, 1899 to 1902. Uh, people like uh, Pete Colonia were, were uh, sent to St. Helena. Many, many Boers, Boer fighters were sent to St. Helena. Um, as I say, still a British uh, crown colony to this day. Where are we at? Okay, uh, speaking of South Africa and the Boers, what a great intro for the, uh, where are we at? 26th of March, 1902. Cecil Rhodes died. Cecil Rhodes, the British mining magnate and imperialist. Um, fascinating character. He was born in 1853 in Bishop Stortford in Hertfordshire. His father was a clergyman, so he didn't come from the he did not come from the top drawer of uh, the British establishment at all. So the upper middle class would probably be how you'd describe him. He went to South Africa when he was oh god about 17 because of bad health, weak heart, 
and they thought what the the warm climate of South Africa would would uh, his father his brother was already farming there in in Natal, and he was sent over there to you know the the, the nice temperature might might sort of be good for his lungs. They ended up in Kimberley, and um, he ultimately ended up dominating the Kimberley diamond mining industry and forming the De Beers Company, which still, of course, dominates the diamond mining world to this day, in particular in South Africa, of course, in, in Kimberley. So that was where his wealth came from. And he then used his wealth. He became an imperialist, uh, believed in Britain's destiny to rule as much of the world as possible. He had some very grandiose ideas, actually. He believed that the uh, the British and the Americans should sort of come back together and form some sort of Anglo-Saxon power block. He also believed the Germans should somehow be involved in that power block as well. Uh, he had great designs to paint as much of Africa red, British red, as possible. He actually said if he could annex the stars for Britain, he would. Uh, and But he was, a, he, uh, yeah, an interesting character. He had visions of having a Cape to Cairo railway on British territory all the way through Africa. And um, he was heavily involved in Transvaal. Transvaal was an independent Boer Republic, uh, but he was heavily involved in the mining, gold mining industry there. Came in late, but he had the money and resources from his diamond mines in Kimberley to, to start buying in big time in Johannesburg. So he had significant mining interests in the Boer Republic of Transvaal. And of course, um, just putting it into a bit of historic order, he then formed a company. The British, the British government weren't keen on empire. Uh, certainly weren't in the late 1880s. You, if you followed my stories of Gordon in Khartoum, you'll know that William Gladstone definitely wasn't into empire. Saw it as a waste of waste of money. Why would you want to have godforsaken parts of the world and be paying for them and probably having to fight wars in them against the locals for no great economic benefit? It'd be much easier just to be able to trade, have free trade with people. So that's where Gladstone was coming from. Um, the Tories weren't much better. They were starting to swing. Lord Salisbury was starting to, um, to, to swing behind imperialism. Anyone who's read the book, A Scramble for Africa, really good read, actually, uh, by Thomas Paxman. Uh, Thomas Paxman, uh, Thomas, sorry, uh, Thomas Pakenham. Uh, a really good book, I thoroughly recommend it. And of course, again, it shows that it wasn't just the Brits involved in the scramble for Africa. And sometimes, certainly on my channel, you get quite a few comments that, you know, the British were the only people involved in colonial Africa. Um, look how much of Africa the French had. And by the way, let's just look at the track record of what, how the Germans behaved in Africa and indeed the Belgians. OK, or at least King Leopold of Belgium. Um, but um, not, not saying the British were, 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 were absolute saints, by the way. But anyway, he then formed a company. He basically said the British government weren't interested in moving inland and forming, you know, painting much, as much of Africa red as possible. So he formed the British South Africa Company, which is a private company, a little bit like the East India Company. And using a group of pioneers and an armed police force, he occupied uh, and fought wars in what's now modern day Zimbabwe and then took over most of Zambia as well. Uh, and Zambia became Northern Rhodesia, named after him. And Zimbabwe was called uh, Southern Rhodesia, uh, named after him. So along with Simon Bolivar and um, oh, Ibs, Ibn Saud, uh, the only people to have had countries named after them, Saudi Arabia, Bolivia, Rhodesia. Two Rhodesias, actually, so he probably wins that one, doesn't he? Um, but uh, part of his Rhodes' plans, he became Prime Minister of the Cape Colony in 1890, uh, and using both that political power in the Cape and also his uh, armed force in the British South Africa Company Police, he tried to instigate a, an uprising from foreigners called uh, uh, Wheatlanders, in Johannesburg, in, in Transvaal, to overthrow the Boer Republic of President Kruger. And just to make sure that that uprising really went well, he actually sent in his police force from Zimbabwe, where he actually moved them down into modern-day Botswana, the British South, Africa Company, British South Africa Company police force, under his henchman, uh, Dr. Jameson, and they launched a raid into, it was called the Jameson Raid. He basically invaded the Boer Republic of, of Transvaal with his own private police force, which... You can say it's outrageous, and it was outrageous, but it strikes me, what a different era we had. Can you imagine Tesco having their own 
internal security force, you know, for gu guarding the stores and things, which is sort of what Cecil Rhodes claimed his police force was supposed to be doing in Zimbabwe. And then Tesco using their armed guards to invade, I don't know, Ireland and try and take it over. I mean, when you think about it, it's both audacious and outrageous at the same time. Um, anyway, long story short, he obviously, thank, the Jameson raid failed. He was seen as the arch imperialist by the Boers. He was also seen as the man who was going to try and bring them down. Uh, they, they knew what Rhodes was about. And um, a large part of the Boer, I mean, Jan Smuts, future South Africa prime minister, Boer, Boer commando leader, uh, general in the, in the uh, Boer War, actually said the first shots of the Boer War, which started in 1899, were fired with the Jameson raid. And I think there's probably a lot of truth in that. Um, anyway, at the uh, all of this happened by the time he uh, he, he died in 1902, Musenberg, in, uh, near Cape Town, and he was only 48 years old. So let's just get this right, okay? Whatever you think about Rhodes, uh, and you, people have got every right to believe he was like the devil incarnate. I get that. Um, here is a man that by the age of 48 had cornered the Kimberley diamond mine diamond mining market, okay? Formed the De Beers Company, formed the British South Africa Company, had taken over Zimbabwe and Zambia, bigger than Britain, okay? Uh, Prime Minister of the Cape Colony, had tried to have a, a rebellion in Transvaal by leading his own, oh, not, he, not personally, but sending his own police force into, in, into Transvaal to try and overthrow the government there. Uh, significant, um, significant mining interests in Johannesburg. He also, funny enough, uh, lent trains to General Kitchener, who was building his, uh, as his, his advance into Sudan, he actually uh, lent some trains to Kitchener because obviously he had a vested interest in the, in the, uh, in the Cape to Cairo Railway. He, of course, set up in his bequeathment, he set up the Rhodes Scholarship, which exists to this day. So um, pirate, great British patriot, you take your pick, but certainly a man whose legacy, he died at 48, and his legacy still uh, extends across Southern Africa to this day. And you could argue with the Rhodes Scholarship uh, uh, continues uh, to this day as well. I'm sure there's bound to have been a little bit of uh, comment there. <laughs> oh, we, is it not true that Blackadder said the German Empire consists of a small sausage factory in Tanganyika? Um, it was a bit, bit more. The Germans, uh, the G Germans had uh, what's now Tanzania. They also had what's now Namibia. Cameroon was a German colony. Uh, Togo was a German colony in Africa. They were the main things. They also had some some islands in the Pacific, like uh, Western Samoa. Was, was German, the northern half of Papua New Guinea, uh, and they had a concession, they had the Marshall Islands or something like that in the Pacific as well, and they had a little tiny concession port in uh, China, Qingzhou, which is where Qingzhou beer comes from, for those of you who like your Qingzhou beer, when you go to a Chinese restaurant, that's why the Chinese have this weird Pilsner lager, it's because the Germans had established a brewery at Qingzhou uh, when they had the concession port there. Uh, Qingtai was taken over at the beginning of the First World War by a, a British and Japanese troops when they were on the same side. There you go. Um, German East Africa at the time, that's what Tanzania was called, or should I say uh, Tanganyika, because the British owned Zanzibar. T Tanzania now is the mainland of Tanganyika and Zanzibar. That's how the name came. Tanzania was from the Zanzibar bit. Um, but anyway... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, David, in uh, Japan. Uh, Tesco uh, just spreading meal deals like it was democracy. Uh, <laughs> Rwanda was briefly a German colony. Yes, expat, expat. Yes, when when the, the German East Africa, Tanganyika, also had Rwanda and indeed Bur uh, uh, Burundi were a part of the German Empire. And after the First World War, whilst the British were given the mandate to look after most of Tanganyika, two little bits were hived off to the Belgians who owned, uh, at the time, uh, were in control of modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo, Zaire, uh, as it was called, uh, and they were given those two as like, like sort of a little, you know, well done for fighting in the war sort of thing. Um, Is De Beers still blocked from trading in the United States? Haven't got a clue. Um, 
The Bismarck Archipelago is still named that in, yeah, the north end of Papua New Guinea. Top end of Solomon Islands, I'm sure it is. New Guinea, I think. Uh, yeah, that would be the Bismarck Archipelago, and that is based on the German influence there. There you go. Right, we are rocking. We've just gone through the hour, but I did say I would I would finish off today with the Battle of Toten in 1461. 29th of March happened to be Palm Sunday. In 1461, England's bloodiest battle, Battle of Toten, Toten in Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, just south of Tadcaster, not far from York. Fought in the Wars of the Roses, and... Um, I've just seen a good comment come up. I'm not going to go there, but uh, thank you very much, Terry, for throwing that one in. Uh, the um, 29th of uh, it fought in the Wars of the Roses. Wars of the Roses, a dynastic dispute in the House of Plantagenet. Basically, the descendants of Edward III had divided up between uh, the he had he had several sons, but two particular sons. One was the Duke of York. One was the Duke of Lancaster. Okay. And uh, they formed the houses of York and Lancaster, but they're all part of the Plantagenets. Things came to a head. Uh, but basically, both sides believed that both houses believed they were the rightful kings. The Lancastrians had effectively acted first. He uh, Henry IV, Henry Bolingbroke, had seized the throne of his cousin, Richard II. Uh, his son was Henry V, and his grandson was Henry VI. The Wars of the Roses happened in Henry VI's time. Uh, started at the Battle of St. Albans, first Battle of St. Albans, between the House of York and the House of Lancaster. Basically, uh, Richard of York, leader of the House of Lancaster by this stage, was killed at the Battle of Wakefield, also in Yorkshire. And his son, Edward, Earl of March, only in his uh, late teens, beginning 20s, excuse me, became uh, the leader of the House of York, de facto leader of the House of York, had a stunning victory. Uh, after his father had been defeated up at Wakefield and killed, as indeed well, his younger brother had been there as well. He was killed at the, or executed at the end of uh, the Battle of Wakefield. Uh, so House of Lancaster on the march. Edward gathered his forces in the traditional Mortimer, which was part of their family, um, another in-laws, down in Herefordshire, Shropshire, around Ludlow Castle, and took on the uh, an invading Lancastrian army who were coming out of Wales to finish him off. They were led by a man called Jasper Tudor. And if you think, oh, that's an interesting name, yep, he was Henry VII, Henry Tudor's granddad, okay? Uh, and, uh, so, sorry, sorry, Owain Tudor, beg your pardon, Owain Tudor. He was accompanied by Jasper Tudor, who was Henry Tudor's uncle. Um, so, um, and he, uh, Edward was now having to face these two mighty Welsh warlords coming out of Wales with their Lancastrian army. He took them on at the um, uh, Battle of Mortimer's Cross and defeated them. So, Aurori proved his, his prowess, marched on London, where um, he allied with uh, the Earl of Warwick, and then he went up towards Yorkshire. And at the Battle of Telton, fought on the 29th of March, 1461. Edward led his forces against forces loyal to Henry VI. Henry VI uh, was a bit of a liability as a leader, mainly because he was suffering from a series of mental breakdowns. So he wasn't at the Battle of Towton. Some of his nobles led the Lancastrian army at Towton, which is always dangerous, isn't it? Because, and that actually was decisive, or one of the decisive factors at Towton. The, the Yorkists could see their man the man they were fighting for. Uh, by the way, Edward, the, who became Edward the Fourth, Edward Earl of March at this time, he was six foot four, which in the Middle Ages was pretty damn good going, wasn't it? There he was on a horse, riding along up and down the front of his front of his army, right in the middle of the fight. Uh, you could see him. You could certainly see him. Uh, and they, meanwhile, the Lancastrians are thinking, "Where the hell's our king? Where's where's the bloke we're fighting for?" Hmm. Uh, because he and his wife Margaret of Anjou, and she was a hell of a woman. Uh, and their young son, uh, also called Henry, uh, no, anyway, uh, they were in York, so a few miles away. The battle started, the Battle of Toten started in a snowstorm, snow blizzard. And the Lancastrians fired off into the, 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 the snow was coming from the south, so it was driving into their faces. They fired all their arrows at the Yorkist army. 
And as the blizzard stopped, they realised that all their arrows had basically fallen short. They, they weren't as close to the Yorkist army as they thought they were. And not only did they used up most of their arrow supply, OK, and the, the Yorkist archers hadn't fired back. The Yorkist archers now ran forward into the mud and picked up all those arrows. OK, and um, they now started to fire back, moved into range and fired back. The Lancastrians didn't have any basically artillery. Uh, archers to fire with and came off the high ground they were occupying they had to attack the Yorkists came off the high ground and charged at the Yorkists past all that or through that array of arrows that were coming towards them um, nearly drove them back actually nearly drove the Yorkists off the field until reinforcements arrived reinforcements had been making their way towards Toton the battle lasted I mean, it's a big sl slogging bloody battle it lasted 10 hours and um, all in the snow you know the snow was red with the blood of fallen Englishmen. And um, at the end, they reckon that somewhere between, now the estimates, you always have to be careful with, with medieval uh, chroniclers and their, their, their numbers. But most, most people would say there could have been up to 50,000 men at Toton at some stage during the battle. Don't forget the reinforcements only came late in the day. But up to 50,000 men at the Battle of Toton, which is unbelievable. They estimate that the casualties could have been 20,000 plus casualties, including injured, okay, not just dead. But it sort of puts it on a par with the Battle of the Somme in the First World War, British, British losses in the Battle of the Somme on the opening day of the First World War. Uh, but um, the, the long and short victory for, for Edward, Earl of March, and his Yorkist forces. Henry fled from York, fled to Scotland, along with his wife and his son, and the victorious Edward returned to London, where he was crowned King Edward IV. Now, I've done a series in the past all about the Wars of the Roses, which was about five, no, six talks, which were about 45 minutes each, and really went into a load of detail. And I don't know, people might be interested in me resurrecting that, that, that little series, because it, it wasn't on YouTube. It was something I did privately way back in the day when I was just starting the history chap off. But uh, Wars of the Roses, a real fascinating thing and a lot of folk don't know much more than the, there were the wars of the roses uh, and most people are wondering why the york york and lancashire, lancashire were fighting each other well it wasn't it was two houses from the royal house who just happened to be called the dukes of york and the duke of lancaster rather like we have harry duke of sussex and edward duke of cambridge oh sorry sorry, sorry he's not anymore is he but um but um but we sorry, sorry, William, Duke of Cambridge. Uh, nothing to do with Cambridge. He didn't go to Cambridge University, did he? He went to St Andrews in Scotland. But so it's almost like you know the Cambridge Cambridge versus Sussex. It's got nothing to do with either of the actual counties. Same as the Wars of the Roses. Um, but there we go. So that is a week in British history, a week where we saw slavery, the slave trade abolished. We saw the bloodiest battle in English history during the Wars of the Roses. Uh, we saw uh, Robert the Bruce being crowned. We saw uh, we saw Cecil Rhodes uh, dying uh, in British imperialist. We also saw a Battle of Margate, which I didn't talk about, but hey, we've run out of time, uh, which was in the Hundred Years' War where the English, it was naval battle, and the English defeated a French and Castilian fleet uh, with some Flemish help as well. Um, and uh, uh, there, we, there we go. We had uh, Scott of the Antarctic dying this week. Uh, we've had uh, the Battle of Klobani, which, you know, look my video if you haven't already. Watch my video from last night as well, if you haven't watched that, all about the Bantam Battalions. Uh, and that was due to so many comments on YouTube. I told you earlier, I read the comments and I do take note. So thank you very much, all of you. And even today, we've even talked about Maundy Money, uh, the Maundy, Maundy Money Services in England and Hot Cross Buns. So there you go. Uh, good Friday. Good afternoon. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter, because I won't be speaking to you before. And uh, I'll see you this time next week, Friday, one o'clock. And in the meantime, another video will be coming out here on YouTube. Thank you ever so much. Um, let's just have a quick look, make sure I haven't missed anything. Colin, Towton rhymes with cow. Uh, it, it might do, but I've also heard Yorkshire people call it Toton. So you take your, you take your pick. Um, English, great one, isn't it? Um, Tasha, you said that the, the estimate closer to a thousand. Yeah, I've seen people saying physically impossible to have gathered that many men, but yeah, um, 
it's a great one, isn't it? It's definitely definitely the biggest battle in English history and the bloodiest. Um, you loved the video last night on the Bantams. Thank you very much indeed, Colin. Uh, Charlie, you thought it was awesome as well. Thank you very much, Colin. Happy Easter to you. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter, Sarah Jane. Happy Easter, Jen. Happy Easter to all of you. And I will see you again, as I say, this time next week for a live. And I'll be getting out another video in the meantime. Take care.